just going to wait about 20 more seconds as people come in. Okay. All right, I think we are gonna get started this morning. Uh, so I wanna welcome everyone to our final day of the Adam Talks Mental Illness Awareness Virtual Seminar. It's been a great week so far, and we're so excited to have Dr. Saima Malik here to talk about children and anxiety to finish off our week. Uh, before we get started, I do wanna let everyone know that this is a webinar style uh, Zoom meeting, so no one can be seen or heard uh, so you don't need to worry about that. I'll briefly introduce myself. My name is Vienna Code, and I am the Public Education Coordinator here at Adam, and I'll be your host for today. I'd also like to thank my two colleagues, Susanna and Carlene, who have helped make this event possible. And I also want to thank all our speakers who have um, donated their time and willingness to uh, bring awareness to Mental Health Week. Before I hand things over to Saima, I do want to briefly go over who we are at the Anxiety Disorders Association of Manitoba and what we offer. So we are a nonprofit registered charity and peer support organization that offers virtual self-help programs for all Manitobans affected by anxiety disorders. Um, all of the staff here at Adam have lived experience with anxiety, which makes our, our organization quite unique. And we offer programs for individuals over the age of 18, and they're all based on cognitive behavioral therapy. And we provide ongoing support and prevention education for the management of anxiety disorders. A couple housekeeping things to go over. Um, I do wanna let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded. As I said earlier, you can't be seen, you can't be heard, so not to worry about that. There is a question and answer box um, on Zoom as well as a chat function. Please ask all your questions in the Q&A and comments can go in the chat. We won't respond to them throughout the presentation, but we'll have about a eight to 10 minute question period at the end where we will cover all your questions. Before I introduce our fabulous speaker of the day, I am gonna take a moment to do a land acknowledgement. So I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered here on Treaty 1 territory, which is the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, the Dene, the Cree, the Oji Cree, and the Dakota people and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We remember that all of the people of all of the generations for thousands of years who lived, loved, worked, died, and were buried on this land remain here. They have not left, they have merely been transformed. We remember to tread softly on this earth as we offer our respect and gratitude to the traditional caretakers of this land, those living now and those who have lived before and those who have yet to come into being. I would now like to introduce our speaker of the morning, Dr. Saima Malik. Saima Malik is a clinical psychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Health Psychology College of Medicine, Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. She received her doctorate in clinical psychology at the California School of Professional Psychology, San Francisco. Saima specializes in early intervention and prevention by supporting child-parent attachment relationships. This includes assessment and treatment of young children under the age of five with complex developmental, medical, psychosocial, and trauma histories. Understanding the impact of stress and adverse childhood experiences on health and development is a strong area of clinical and research interest, along with prevention, early intervention, and advocacy for children and families. So welcome, Dr. Malik. Uh, thank you for being here, and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Vienna, for that wonderful introduction and for that beautiful land acknowledgement. I, it brought tears to my eyes as I, as I thought about how meaningful that, that uh, statement was. And I do appreciate that um, as I'm sure most of the uh, uh, participants today um, do as well. 
And so I do thank Adam uh, and you for reaching out to me to invite me to be part of this uh, Mental Illness Awareness Week uh, summit that you have arranged and organized for all your um, uh, followers uh, in your education group and your website. And from what I understand, you have a very wide reaching um, mailing list. And so I'm very excited to be part of this um, initiative that you've created and organized. And so I'm hoping that today's talk will be meaningful for, for those who are in attendance and for those who will, will watch this recording at a later time. I uh, hope that this is something that has some nice takeaways. And so it is a quite a broad to um, umbrella topic. And so my hope in creating this presentation was to try to touch on the pieces that I think from my clinical experience uh, will be the most meaningful for families. And so my assumption is, and people can put in the chat, um, if that most people who are attending today are parents who are interested, but I'm also guessing there might be some professionals as well, um, maybe parents who are professionals like I am. So um, sometimes we don't just wear one hat, sometimes more than one. So of course, if people wanna put that in the chat, you know, what, what who they are and, um, what they're hoping to get from this, that would be that would be very helpful. Um, of course, we can't see that. I can't see that right now, but um, that could help us a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to move along here just to kind of look at what the objectives of today's talk is, just to review some of the basics of anxiety, um, gain a better understanding of anxiety in children and youth, and learn how parents or caregivers can help children manage anxiety. And then also look at some available and recommended resources. And so I tried to think about what are parent-friendly, um, accessible, uh, free or low-cost resources that are um, credible and uh, well-validated. So things like that. Okay, so let's start with what is anxiety, right? So everybody has worries. So we know this. And so this is, this is normal and can be actually quite adaptive. And so we want to distinguish normal worries, typical worries that we all have from anxiety. So we all worry. We know this. And so we're talking about anxiety that it worries that are beyond the just worries that we all have that really become what we think of as excessive and uncontrollable or also interfering with our day to day lives. So I thought it would be helpful to start with kind of thinking about why we have such strong reactions to worries. Uh, and why some people have these strong reactions. And so we're going to think a little bit about the brain right now. And I don't have an image, but I can use my hand. So the amygdala is what we think of as the alarm center in our brain. And it's actually, if we use our hand, it would be, I'm going to use the lower part of my hand as the, as the lower brain, which is the reptilian brain, the limbic system. So the part of the brain that controls just basic function is down here. And then we go up here and it's more of like reactions. So this is the part where the amygdala lives in this part of our brain. So it's deep in our brain. It's And it's an old part of the brain that developed millions of years ago to protect us. So it's not going to go anywhere. And so we have to respect and understand this aspect of our brain. And then what we have Above that area of the brain is the upstairs brain. So that's considered the neocortex, the part of the brain that makes us human, the part that lets us think, problem solve, plan, organize, reflect, um, consider, you know, how to, how to resolve problems and how to make better choices the next time. And so what we ideally want is an integrated brain that can use both the upstairs and the downstairs brain. I mean, what happens when we have this excessive and uncontrollable worry is the amygdala, which lives down here in the downstairs brain, takes over and it's a reactive part of the brain. It doesn't have the capacity to think or problem solve or reflect or pause and say, wait, that's not something to be really worried about. I don't have to overreact to this. And so we don't have the amygdala doesn't have that capacity. And so so it's important that we understand this aspect of the brain because that's what can get in our way it can both be adaptive and problematic and so it was designed to protect us from threat real or perceived and so when it gets to be a problem is when our amygdala is sounding all the time and it's not necessary and what i want to do is show a video a short video that actually 
describes this really nicely. And so this is a video that I think can be useful for future reference and for viewing together with your child or a group of students. If you're a teacher or you work in a setting where you have, you have children in your care um, and that could be helpful to you. So I do want you to reference this again in the future. So I'm gonna play it here for all of us. You know that scared or nervous feeling you get when you have to do something you're not sure you can do? or go somewhere you've never been before? That feeling is called anxiety. And it can feel a bit different for each person, but it usually doesn't feel very nice. Maybe your palms get sweaty, or your body tenses up, or maybe you get a tummy ache. Maybe you've heard of anxiety, or maybe you haven't, but you've definitely felt it before. Because everyone feels it sometimes. It's normal. You want to know something really weird about anxiety? It's actually trying to help you. It's true. All those uncomfortable feelings, those happen because your brain thinks you're in danger and it wants to protect you. When our muscles tense up and we sweat, it gets us ready to do a lot of exercise, which is helpful if you need to jump out of the way of a runaway train or wrestle a wolverine. Sometimes our minds go blank and we feel like we can't move or talk. That would be great if we needed to hide. Instead, we just feel stuck. When your brain does this, it's called fight, flight, or freeze. The problem is, sometimes your brain gets confused and it can't tell the difference between a charging moose and, say, going to a new school. Both things can be scary and cause anxiety. But there aren't any dangerous wild animals at a new school, hopefully. Understanding where anxiety comes from is the first step in learning to deal with it. So the next time you're in one of those tough situations and you start to feel those feelings, like butterflies in your stomach or sweaty palms, or it gets hard to talk or move, remember, there's nothing wrong with your body. You're just having normal feelings of anxiety and they're actually trying to help. <laughs> Even if they're not very good at it sometimes. You know that's- Okay, so, oh, I skipped a slide there. So that video is a, I like that video and that's from the Anxiety Canada website. So uh, at the very end, it lists, I do have it at the very last slide in my, in my presentation here, um, the website for um, where that I found that video. And so they have a lot of great resources. So that's something just to keep in mind. And that's one of the things I want all everyone to take away from today's talk is where, what are reputable websites to go to for good information that you can trust and feel confident in. And that's one of them that we highly recommend to all families that uh, we see, especially in my clinic where I work. Um, we are, are often referring families to that website for their own, um, to, 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 to pace themselves through the material at their own at their own pace and to look at the materials that are relevant to them, um, that we know has been well um, curated and vetted. And um, it's something that's just trustworthy. So again, so as the video highlights that, um, worries can be adaptive and helpful when necessary. But what we're talking about is when we're worrying about going to a new school or um, going to a sleepover or things that are just part of, um, for children, everyday childhood experiences that we want them to participate in and we want to help them with. Making a new friend, let's say at daycare or at preschool or kindergarten, things like that. And so we tend to see these things start to bubble up um, in those first experiences when kids are starting to explore and have new experiences for the first time. So this tends to be more common when that when kids are trying something new for the first time, going on their first sleepover camp, their first um, sleepover at a friend's house, um, first time, first many things like fill in the blank. So we're thinking about anxiety when it when worrying is a problem. So we want to think about when when should I be worried about worrying? Right, pun intended. So we all know we worry and not all worries are problematic and some are helpful. 
but then they're the ones that are not helpful. So what we're thinking about is for kids, when we're seeing kids worrying most more often, which means most days and for weeks or months at a time, and we're also seeing that the intensity is more for our child than for other children of the same age. So you might go to drop off at school and your child is clinging to your leg and having a really hard time with a very routine experience. And you're looking around and you're saying, hmm, this doesn't seem to be the case for the other kids. I wonder what's going on. I wonder if this is typical. And so that's a very, that's a very common starting place for lots of parents. And so like, like the video mentions, and I mentioned already, often it's this, the amygdala, which is again, the part of the brain that's designed to sense danger and threats and to protect us. The problem with anxiety is that children are pulling that alarm, you know, like, like at the school, pulling the fire alarm on the wall. So everyone's running, thinking that there's a fire. They have to run and do their, do the things they learn in a fire drill. It turns out there is no fire. And so you get all worked up and you do everything that you, you're supposed to do to protect yourself, but there's no threat and there's nothing to fight against. There's nothing to run from as the video elicited, um, illustrated, pardon me. So, so children are having these intense experiences more frequently and more intensely than children of the same age, and it's causing disruptions in their daily lives. So that's a very important distinction. So it's also interfering with their activities. So now maybe they're, they're saying they're too, they don't feel well and they, they, they can't go to school. And I mean, they truly may feel unwell because, uh, because of the way their bodies are reacting to their worries. So they may in fact, have a headache, a stomach ache, things like that. And so, so then um, they might be missing out on different clubs that they or extracurriculars that they are actually really interested in. Maybe they don't want to socialize. Now I will be touching on COVID, of course, and how that's affected us, all of us, especially children. And so, so we're thinking in these broad terms, right? So it's happening more intensely, more often, and then it's disrupting their day-to-day -day lives. And there are lots of different types of anxiety. I'm not going to go into any of them in, 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 in any detail. I'm going to think broadly about anxiety and really what we think of as generalized anxiety disorder because that's the most common presentation for children and adults. And so regardless of the type of anxiety, they usually get clustered into four areas. So we have physical responses, our thoughts, our emotions, and our behaviors that are related to they're all interrelated. And um, so we tend to think of it in these terms. So we have a physical reaction, which the video ha already highlighted, and then that can lead to often faulty thinking. So I, I can never go to school. I'm so scared. I can, I'll never be able to go to school. I'll never feel comfortable. So there's the thought. And then the, the emotion, fear. You know, school is, going to school is scary. And then the behavior, I, I, I just refuse. I just won't get go to school. I just, you know. So then we, then we tend to see the behaviors, but there, it often is tied to all these other the emotions, the thoughts, and then the physiological or physical responses in the body. And here I listed just for reference. These are the the in the diagnostic and statistical manual that we use to diagnose various disorders, mental mental disorders. Um, anxiety disorders are listed in there. And um, here is a, a snapshot of that from the manual that we use. This is the current manual. And so there have been some changes. And so, and this is why there's a lot. And so I don't think that it's um, helpful to go into these details, but there are different ways that anxiety can present just for everyone's reference. Um, and so we, one of the very important things I think is to ask ourselves, how common is anxiety? If we all worry and we know that anxiety is the extreme end of worrying, well, how common is it? Well, research is telling us that one in four Canadians may experience some form of anxiety at some point in their lifetime. And that for children, it's the leading mental health issue for Canadian children. Um, I don't know if I missed a slide here. Just gonna see. Um, and like I mentioned, so when I say anxiety, I'm thinking about generalized anxiety, which is not a specific phobia, but it can be, you know, for younger children, it can look like separation anxiety, it can look like um, social anxiety. Um, I tend to think of that in broadly as anxiety because that's um, relevant to younger children. And then I think that as kids 
mature a little bit, it can start to become, it can become more generalized or it can become more specific or both. So it can look, it can present in many different ways. And so anxiety at its base, we want to think about it generally speaking so that this, the same ideas apply, but there may be some specific nuances to treat, let's say a phobia versus generalized anxiety versus selective mutism. So so that does matter when you get to that level. So if you are a, a parent or a caregiver in that situation, trying to think about what's the best way, a best approach, that would be where you work with a professional and they would help guide you through that. And so that's not something that you would have to know about or decide. So this talk is not intended for you to suddenly become an expert in anxiety, but to know enough to know, do I need to know more? Do I? Where do I go for for now what can we do for now to help us and then if this is not helping where can we go beyond this what, what would be helpful in the community so we know that that anxiety is quite common some form of anxiety um we also know that there is there's no singular cause so this is a very common question that people ask like what causes anxiety so there's no one cause and so i put together this um this 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 uh, visual to to highlight how complex this is so you have the child's contributions which i have in the first um the first uh if you can see my i don't know if you can see my cursor um on the left of the of the first box inborn traits so that's genetics temperament the develop, developmental needs so your child might have autism might have adhd might have a learning disability Right, there might be some some other things going on, and then they might have physical health um, complications. So they might have cerebral palsy, or some kind of illness or chronic health issue, and they also may have sensory needs that um, we all have take in information through our senses differently, and that can affect how we interact in the in the world and with our environment, and that can relate to the our response their responsivity to the environment. So. We tend to see kids that are more sensitive, they can be more reactive and more, um, uh, more anxious because too many things are overwhelming. So the lights, the sounds, the, the tactile, the, the feel of the clothing, and this, this can be tied with the other, the other developmental needs that they have. Like, for example, someone, a child with autism might have autism and anxiety go hand in hand often. They might have learning challenges, they might have ADHD, so there could be lots of neurodiversity there. And then they can also often have sensory sensitivities, meaning that the information is just overwhelming coming through the senses. And then, then we move into the second kind of category of family or home environment that also plays a significant role. So the quality of the parent-child relationship, so the goodness of fit, the quality of the attachment between the parent and child learn behaviors from, from the home environment. So that could be from parents, siblings, family dynamics. So that could be family stressors, um, the way that conflict and emotions are modeled and resolved and communicated. And then you get into more challenging things like stress, trauma, loss, and also if there's parental or family illness or injury, right? So that can be very stressful and anxiety provoking because when a parent's health is in jeopardy, that will always undermine a child's health because a child needs their parent uh, to be healthy and um, able to, to parent and be present. And so those are worries that would be natural, but they can grow into worries that take over because they don't have control over, over an adult's health um, or well being. And so that can be things like addiction, mental illness, physical illness or well-being so it can, it can cover many broad topics and so then we so you can see under each category there's a lot that loads into it and so it's you can see just from a snapshot it would be very hard to say what is a singular cause and I don't have a singular cause here listed because it's impossible we know that there are contributions and this is part of what I do in my work is that I help families understand that there can be many factors bringing coming together to, to present, to, to, to create the situation that they're struggling with, the child and family, because that's typically what happens. Um, now I'm gonna see, uh, now I also have in this last um, 
umbrella term is society and community level. So I can't quite see my screen because of, let me see if I can change my view. Um, so, uh, so that's school, peer group, all the things that are beyond the family, beyond the individual and the family and home environment, and then sort of broadly community-based. So do you have extended family? Do you have access to um, other influences and cultural uh, factors as well? So what are the cultural norms? Um, you know, do neighbors talk anymore? Do they help each other out? Is there any influence like that? Family, friends, things like that. Um, even I, I, I thought about, you know, just how technology has changed the way we relate and, and, in, a, in a broad sense. So we don't always see each other. We don't always just come over to people's houses. You know, when I grew up, you know, people just showed up at your house. You didn't call first. You didn't text. There was no texting. You just had to try them and check and see if they're home. And then you didn't know who it was. You didn't have a, a, a camera at the door to check. You just had to open the door. So a lot has changed culturally and societally for us as a, as a group. Um, so I think all of that loads in too. So that's something that families are experiencing and children are experiencing, and then especially teens. So we, have, we know screen time and access to, 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 to technology is affecting children in many ways. And one of the ways, and I, I don't know if I have it on the slide or I'm gonna see if I'm gonna move on to the next slide for a moment. Um, Uh, I think it's on this slide. So we know that um, social media can have lots of positive influence, but it can also have lots of downsides. So the fact that you have access all the time, you have access to things that you wouldn't have access to before. So you don't get invited to a party before you didn't know what happened. Now you get, you see it on Snapchat or TikTok or whatever the latest platform is. And without wanting to be included, you're sort of pulled in and it can get dramatic and it can also increase anxiety and add to stress for, especially for teens, for teenagers who are feeling isolated. And so technology can be helpful, but it can also lead to more isolation. It can lead to comparisons, to feeling like I need to fit in rather than a feeling of belonging, which is really about aligning with people who share your values and feeling like you found your village or your tribe, you know, your people. And so that's that would be the goal, but social media, on paper, sounds like it can help us with that, but sometimes it's a slippery slope. It, sometimes it can help connect us. And sometimes like right now we're connecting over a, a, a virtual platform, which is amazing, but it can also have its downsides. And so it's that slippery slope and we have to always be mindful of that. So we know that anxiety is on the rise. And so I think it's helpful for us to think about, and I think this is where I talk about this, right? So a little more closely what's happening that we're seeing more anxiety? Well, I think I've touched on this. Um, well, a couple of things I didn't touch on. Um, I think in general, society is more cognizant and recognizing that um, emotional well-being is part of a holistic view of health. So we're not trying to compartmentalize as much. We still are. So I think there's still room for improvement there. So you go to your, your doctor, your primary care provider, and I don't think it's routine yet to talk about your mental health. I think that's what we're trying to do. I think Adam is doing an amazing job and other organizations like that, um, where we're trying to say, you know, let's not separate it. If I'm not, if I'm anxious or worried, if I'm depressed, if I am, if I'm excessively stressed, that's going to affect my physical health and vice versa. So my physical health, if I have an illness or injury can affect my emotional and mental health. They're very closely related. And so it's very hard to separate them. But I think Western society has done this, has separated them. And we're trying to go back to a more holistic view. Of course, other changes that have happened, we're more distant from extended family members. Like I mentioned, you know, we don't have people just dropping by, just casually hanging out. And of course, COVID did not help that. So we are post, I don't even know, are we post? We're sort of coming out of COVID. We're trying to figure out how we navigate whatever phase we're in. I'm not sure what the technical term is. 
Um, and what the other thing is, so I'm going to talk more a little bit in a, in a minute about COVID and all the uh, what and the impact I think that's having on us and how we can think about that. Um, what we also know from research is that even though we have access to more people online and in different formats, you know, different social media platforms or different virtual platforms, you can have a folk, you can have a support group on Facebook, a closed group, so everyone feels like they can share private information, but you don't necessarily have a friend that you can call when you're really in dire straits. Like you really, really need to see someone and just have them over for coffee or go and meet them somewhere because you just need to connect. You need to just talk to someone. Maybe you need a hug. And so we might have 200 friends on Facebook, but not maybe two good friends that we can really reach out to in a moment of need. And so what we're seeing is more loneliness. And so we're more connected, you know, on paper, but in reality, in a, in the practical sense, we don't always, it doesn't necessarily translate to real connection in real time in the human way that we need. We're designed, we're social beings and we need connection to thrive and we need connection to be healthy. And so that's why I think these are big changes that are contributing to what, why we're seeing a rise in anxiety. Um, and so this is, I, I found this online, this um, infographic from the Health Canada website. This was based on a health behavior uh, research study looking at youth health and well-being. And so this is just um, highlights some of the findings from the study that lots of young people in grade 10, they polled, um, you see they are feeling sad and hopeless very often um wish they were someone else often felt lonely again just going back to that last point that i just touched on that there's a, this pervasive loneliness so lots of friends on social media lots of likes lots of um pseudo connection but not genuine connection right finding your tribe and we know and so the last you know i love that they put this relationships matter we all play a role in promoting youth mental health and so this is really where, where I, what I love, this is what I focus on in my work, that relationship is what actually helps um, young people and young people and adults alike heal and um, come through hard times, understand, you know, that their struggles are temporary and can be worked through, that there can be a solution and that they have support if they're connected to the right people that feel supportive to them. And so, um, so again, I think I touched on some of this already, so I'm not gonna go into this. So, so this is, um, I mentioned that, you know, of course we all know that we were, we have, as a, as a society have experienced, I mean, when I say society, I mean the world, right? The whole world simultaneously experienced a worldwide pandemic and worldwide restrictions that we had never done, most of us, some of us, some pe some folks I've talked to have lived through other pandemics and have talked about the similarities and differences. But for many of us, this is our first experience having so few re recourse, you know, such few, such, such, such few recourses, you know, that, that we have to do what we're told. We don't know. We have so much uncertainty. We don't have answers. The authority figures don't have answers that, you know, the medical professionals who we typically turn to first for help don't have answers. Right. So so we all as a group at every level of group, community, society, world experience this tremendous trauma co collectively. And then and then that looks different. You know, of course, children and families who already have faced adversity, have all kinds of insecurities related to racism lots of isms, food insecurity, housing, financial, family instability, health problems, right? We know that families like that were more affected. So we were not having the same experience. So of course the needs vary. And also that depending on the age of the chi your child, you know, we know, you know, we're hearing about COVID babies and I have a COVID baby. And so, and I think, how is that different? How is it different to have your first baby in COVID, to, to, to not have your partner with you during prenatal visits, to not have them, to not have family members be able to hold your baby, for your baby not to be held by, by 
people who care about them. So, and then not have social experience, go to the store, go to a restaurant, just see people socially, casually, just to learn about social nuances, just to learn about relating. Again, we're relational beings. So I don't think we know yet about the impact, especially for the youngest children, what might be the consequences. But what I think we can anticipate is that we already knew th that the data was showing before the pandemic, that anxiety was on the rise. So I think what we're gonna see is, we're just gonna see it continue to rise. And so it's not to be, you know, this is not to be a doom and gloom um, kind of statement. I think it's really meant to acknowledge that this is a real experience we've had. And so if you are a parent of a child who is struggling and you notice this change that, you know what, they were struggling before, but it's even worse now, I've noticed. And so to me, that sounds like it's on par with lots of families and lots of kids. And so I think what it what it reminds us is that we have to relearn socialization for kids who are old enough who had a pre pre COVID experience and awareness of what does socialization look like, what does it look like to go to school in person, and so of course there's going to be lots of worries and potentially anxiety about that. Is it safe? Can I go without a mask? Are we going to be okay? Those are all natural worries, and so of course there's going to be a lot of it could be tailored to COVID related um, worries, but it could also be normalizing. Like, of course you're worried about that. We all are, we all, we all aren't sure what we're doing, right? And that normalizing and validating can be so helpful. Um, so we saw lots of um, anxiety go up and a lot of avoidance go up because look, we don't have to see each other. We have to stay far apart, right? And so it, it helped people who had avoidance strategies and anxious tendencies avoid their discomfort because they didn't have to interact and they had a kind of a free pass. So by opening the community up again, what we're seeing is people are gonna to have to confront those worries because they don't necessarily have a free pass anymore. Employers are saying, okay, we need you back on site now. You can't work remotely, you know? So that will, that will definitely increase anxiety for adults and kids, right? So now I have to actually figure out how I'm gonna manage this. So, um, you know, I realized that um, I packed in a lot in this talk and I, I'm now just getting to the part where um, this is uh, the section where we talk about uh, parental and family influence. And so we talked more broadly about those other societally, societal and cultural influences. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually speed through this and I'm not going to do it justice. And I apologize in advance for that. Um, I do want to reference this for those who are interested. You can go to the Circle Security website, which is, I don't, I, I think I forgot to list in the resource. I probably will update that uh, for the slides before it's distributed, uh, if that's possible, Vienna. So I'm just going to make, I'm saying it out loud so that I will do it. So, um, but it, it, the, the slides are here um, and the website is very nicely done, very user friendly. And so you can certainly take a look at it when you have more time, if you're interested. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna touch on some, some a couple basic ideas. Why am I talking about this concept of a circle of security? So I said we're relational beings and our first relationships matter the most. We learn everything we are going to know about life, we learn in the first five years. And then after that, we unlearn and relearn, <laughs> essentially. So it's not that we don't learn after five. It's just that it lays the foundation for all of our learning, our later learning. So we actually need to pay attention to our first relationships, which is between infant and parent and or caregiver, and really understand that better. And so, um, so we all learn about different emotions for how we were parented. And this is not intended to blame parents. Uh, and it's really intended to acknowledge that this is just a natural aspect of development. We learn from our parents, they learn from their parents and so forth, right? And then our children learn from us and then their children will learn from them. And every generation tries to hold on to the really good stuff and then let go of the stuff that we all wish we didn't experience. And that's all natural as well. And so all of this is to say that we all go through this 
we all have experiences that we wish we could, we didn't have and ones we, we want to pass on to our kids. And that what we can do is learn about ourselves so that we can learn how we can work on that part that we want to pass on and not the stuff we don't want to pass on because we learn mostly from what, how we're treated and not what we're told. When our needs are met, will my parent understand me well enough to know what I need? And then will they be able to help me? So that's how children, we as children learn and our children learn from us, whether we're in a teaching role or a caregiving role of other capacity, a parent, a daycare provider, um, other support worker. We, children learn from how we are with them, how we are, how they, we are with them in the moment. And that is what they take away from our, their interaction with us. And our ability to support them in being curious and learning. So that's the top of the circle. I'm going to show this visual. So our capacity to, to support them in, in exploring is actually, and then coming back to, for comfort and protection when they are upset or distressed is one of the most natural things we can do as caregivers. And so anxiety tends to be, so we know this is just how we're made. And why are we talking about attachment and secure attachment? Because we know that all children, we all parents want children to thrive and be healthy and all parents are doing their best. And sometimes it's not enough. And then we need to know what we can do about this. And this is what research, research shows us. And I'm not going to list it all. It's here for your reference. That when kids, when children are supported and having their needs met, whether it's exploring or coming back in for comfort and protection, they tend to have all of these positive benefits that are listed. Again, this is all this has all been uh, collated uh, by the Circle Security folks, and you can reference it on the website. Um, and so, this has um, been demonstrated time and again in plenty of research. Um, they're not listed here because it's too, it's too numerous. And so, you can see that there's so many. You you can't pick just one. Parents want all of this for their kids, and so these are all of the potential benefits to being able to meet their children's your children's needs in these ways. And this is where anxiety tends to get in the way. So anxious parents tend to have anxious kids because they struggle with typically the top of that circle. Uh, kids want to explore, they need to explore, that's what they're born to do. And something about that is uncomfortable. And so the message is, uh oh, maybe there's danger here. And again, the amygdala is, is the alarm bell is going off. And, and so, Unintentionally, the message gets sent that I shouldn't or I can't, I sh you know, play on the over there because something about it's not safe. So it's not conscious. It's not that a, a caregiver would set out to to do this. It's it's that complex combination of temperament, environment, child's responsivity, parents' response to child's distress. It's very complicated. So I'm oversimplifying it for the sake of this talk. It was always going to be oversimplified for the sake of this talk. Um, so, um, so I have a couple of questions here. So, so some parents say, I'm a parent and I struggle with anxiety. Am I causing my child to be more anxious? So of course, that's not a simple question or a simple answer. And we know that there's a strong link between anxious parents and anxious kids that's beyond genetics. So we know parents model behaviors and children observe how parents cope and how they're responded to by their parents when they show signs of worry. Are they supported and encouraged to face their fears and to try to be brave despite their discomfort? Or are they unintentionally and sometimes outwardly shamed or criticized? It's not a big deal. Stop crying. Just go. Just try it. It's not, it's not hard. So Sometimes we do this thinking we're, we're helping and sometimes we're actually undermining our efforts. And so we know that kids, young kids who tend to later develop anxiety disorders tend to have cluster around certain common features. So they tend to be, now this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just some trends that I've noticed uh, in, my, in my experience. Um, so they tend to be kids that are slow to warm. So these are the kids that need more time to warm up, to adjust to social experiences or just experience new experiences. 
And they can be more sensitive or reactive to criticism or feedback or the emotions of themselves or others. So they might make a mistake and not be receptive to your acknowledgement of it, your help, your support to them to work through it because they're too reactive themselves. They tend to be more observant. Um, they tend to also have more sensory sensitivities. So senses are the sensory information is a little bit overwhelming and that can lead to the reactivity and the, you know, um, difficulty accepting your help. So there's a cluster of patterns and it doesn't mean if your children are, are showing these signs that they have an anxiety disorder, but it's just something to be aware of that sometimes these tendencies then move into, into more things that interfere with day-to-day -day functioning and, and things that we want kids to experience. And so, as I mentioned, the first five years, the early years are when we tend to develop most of our beliefs and our values. And can you imagine, can you think about that? What do we know by the time we're five? Not a whole lot. So then here we are as an adult operating with a five-year-old brain in charge. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? And some of you might be thinking that can't be true. But if you think about it and really go in, do a deep dive into some of your biggest worries and some of your deepest fears, and you say, where, where did that come from? Where did I develop that idea? That doesn't make a lot of sense. It's often from a very early part of your life. And you won't necessarily know the story or the, the memory won't necessarily come to you about why, but it might be a deeply held value or a deeply held belief, but you can't, you can't put words to why you would think that. So we know this from research. So this is not something that we need to question. It is something that uh, is well-researched and well-validated. And so the idea here is to respect this aspect of development to help us understand how to reduce vulnerability. So if children have these sensitivities that I've listed, and we know they may go on to develop anxiety disorders, we can then get in there and be more proactive and prevent problems from, from um, developing. And so another common question I hear is, why, why do the programs for children often involve working with parents only? So I thought my child has a problem. So why do I need to meet with the counselor or the parent group? Why am I being offered parenting group? So that could be the coaching for confidence group. That could be the circle of security parent group that, that, that I offer at my clinic, um, that some other providers offer in the community. And so this is a common question parents ask. Why, why do I go and why is the child not there? The, my child is the one who's struggling. So why do we believe this? Why do we do this? We believe that parents are the most important people in your child's life and that you are the expert in their, their life. That's hard to believe sometimes, but we truly believe this because you have spent the majority of your time with your child. And so you will know things about your child that we can never, ever get to know in a short period of time. And that it's very normal and typical to feel frustrated when you're helping your child who's struggling with anxiety. And if you get support to help them cope better, they need you, they're less needy and clingy and dependent, which frees you up to do things that you need to do and you feel better. And you, so everybody is feeling a sense of confidence, a sense of mastery. And then parents then also feel heard and seen. So we know that parenting a child with anxiety is really hard. Parenting is hard already. And then parenting a child with anxiety is even harder because you might feel like you're limited in terms of your activities as a family. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't see so-and-so because of their anxiety or their potential response reactivity. So this is why we believe in supporting parents. And it's not always parents only. Sometimes it's a combination of parents get support and then there can be some, some coaching that goes on. And it, it varies by program. So it's not a blanket statement that I can't speak for other for organizations that I'm not a part of, but this is a very common approach to helping children with anxiety is to help parents help their children. So that because you're home with your child, you have more access and more opportunity. Um, so another, another common question, um, I'm mindful of the time. I'm gonna just um, see which, which questions I wanna expand on. So one of the things that often comes up is parents try to be very direct with the kids and address their children's worries by offering reassurance, but then they find it doesn't work. Why isn't it helpful, helping? Why is this, it seems to make sense, but why does it not make sense? Why does it not actually reduce anxiety? Well, we know that kids 
who struggle with worries and anxieties tend to avoid and refuse, right? Because they want to avoid the distressful feelings and avoiding the activity, like say going to school, the distress goes away because I've now avoided the act of going to school and all the feelings that go with it. And so if we, and parents often will do anything to, for their child not to feel distressed. And that can lead to more avoidance. So, so we might say, oh, I don't want to see you so upset. Okay, today it's okay. You don't have to go. I know you have a tummy ache. So, okay, you won't go to school today. Okay. And then, so we might we might contribute in, in unintentionally to the avoidance because we don't want to see them overly stressed. And then we might try to convince them that everything's fine. We might try to take a different tack, which is reassure them, rationalize with them. So this, why is this problematic? Because the part of the brain that's making the decisions isn't the rational brain. It's the, it's the, it's the amygdala, which lives in the reactive brain. So that's like trying to reason with a reptile. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't talk to them and say, don't bite me. Don't attack me. We would just back away. Right. So that's what, what our, our brain does. And your child's brain is doing is saying, stay away from the danger. School is dangerous. Okay. Stay away. And then when we try to reassure, we're trying to talk to the upstairs brain, but the upstairs brain is not connected to the downstairs brain because the downs, the amygdala is in the downstairs brain and has taken over and hijacked the upstairs brain. So there is no capacity to reason with a child who's using their downstairs brain and the amygdala is technically in charge. So that's why that doesn't end up help, being helpful. And so what can we do as parents? So I list a few things here. They're very broad. We want to keep an open mind. We want to practice self-compassion. I have some references at the end, some books for parents to pick up for themselves that really gets into some of these topics in more depth. So if you are a parent that likes to read or listen to audiobooks, you can always get them an audiobook version. So often the more that we can do, the more work we can, emotional work we can do on ourselves as parents, the better we are able to help our children. So that's a broad topic, but that's one of the takeaways I want parents to get is that the more willing you are to do the emotional work on yourself, the more able you're going to be to teach by example, because you're going to have stressful moments and you can be able to model that and and name it and talk about it. And your child will be watching and learning from you. And then you'll be better able to recognize how you can help them. And so, and also when you make mistakes, because you will acknowledge it. And then there's some specific ideas. So acknowledge your child's feeling, even if you think it's over the top and you think this can't be valid. Um, and then so unfortunately, I'm, I realize I'm running out of time and it won't leave time for the question and answer. And so I'm thinking, um, Vienna, I don't know if you can just chime in really quickly. Um, do we have any flexibility to, to extend it? Yeah, we can, we can take a couple questions. That's no trouble. Yeah. And whoever can stay can stay. Okay, okay. So I just wanted to touch on this last slide and then move to questions or to the, the Q&A. Um, okay, so, so acknowledge feelings and then we want to help. We know that the child is gonna have strong physiological reactions. So we wanna first help them calm their body. And actually this is demonstrated in this, in this visual better. So first regulate, then we wanna relate, which is again, we're relational beings. So we wanna connect. And this is often one of the hardest things. The, the first two, regulate and relate. You know, how do I help my child who seems out of control? Their emotions are so over the top. So we want to find those strategies that are calming and every child is different. So that's a very uh, important topic that I can't really expand on right now, but it, it deserves attention. But uh, so that can be looked into further. Um, there's lots of things online that talk about what you can do to help regulate, so deep breathing, mindfulness, meditation, um, touching, getting in touch with your senses. There's lots of, um, lots of strategies that are listed that have already been identified that are, I think, listed on the different websites that I've listed in my slides. And then relate, which is the connection to the important caregiver. And then the reasoning part, which is the thinking through what happened, thinking through the problem solving, what can we do differently? How can we be brave? How can we face this fear? How can we try again? So that's the last step. 
And you can see that's not the first thing we do because the child's not able to hear you. So that's why reassurance doesn't work because we need to do it in this order. And so I, I, I have this last slide, which is really just, just here cheeky for us. You know, don't worry that children never listen to you, worry that they're always watching you, right? Because that's essentially what it is. They're learning from what we do and how we behave and how we model. And then some basic um, uh, tips that I found online that I thought was nice to just as an overview. And then um, this last slide, children are not being manipulative. They're not doing this on purpose. It's not a sign of weakness. Um, they don't want to feel distressed. If they could, they would choose to move past this and they need your help. And um, I have my community resources here. So feel free to click through these. I have the links embedded into the, into the slide. So feel free to look at these websites. There's some really nice free resources on the Anxiety Canada Adam website. So, um, and then some service, uh, community service providers and their websites are listed there as well. And then private psychology and social work um, resources as well, list, list serves. So you can search for uh, professionals if needed, if these other resources are not um, are not enough. And then some books for kids that can be helpful. Again, um, different depending on, you can look at that and see the age range, depending on what might be helpful for you uh, and your child in your specific situation. And then book recommendations for parents. So these are some just overall parenting books. They're not specific to anxiety per se, but they are related and to the, to the, to the ideas that I've touched on today. And I'll leave it there. So thank you everyone for, for um, joining today's talk. And I, I think we're, we have a, couple, a few minutes for some questions. Yes, yes. We'll, do, we'll do a couple questions for sure. Thank you so much, Saima, for your um, presentation. It's very informative. And I think we can take a lot away from it. I do want to briefly discuss um, a program that we offer here at the Anxiety Disorders Association of Manitoba. Um, it is our Coaching for Confidence program, and it is for parents, caregivers, teachers, really anyone who works with children ages 3 to 12 who have symptoms of anxiety and extreme shyness. So those of you who were at our presentation yesterday with Dr. Sexton, he briefly touched on this program. It was developed by Dr. John Walker uh, out of Dalhousie University, and the program teaches it is for parents, um, so it teaches and builds skills to um, help support children with the management of anxiety symptoms. So as Dr. Malik said, um, parents play such a pivotal role in helping children with their anxiety. Um, so it does run for eight classes, and we have evening classes as well as afternoon classes. They will be running January to March, April to June, and September to November those are all in 2023. Um, so you can reach out to Adam um, by emailing us, adam at adam.mb.ca uh, for more information. And just to clarify, Vienna, is this a free program for families? It, that is a great question. It is completely free. Yeah, there is a manual, um, I think it's $25 to purchase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but then other than that, the program is absolutely free. I will answer Dana's question just right now because it's related to what I'm talking about. She asked if there's any classes for teens. Um, we are coming out with a expanded coaching for confidence program. Uh, we will be announcing it shortly. That is for teens because we see the need. And there's a lot of people who do want help for that 12 to 18 range. Um, so we are, we are expanding our program. Okay, I'll get into some questions here. Um, can you talk about offering support to children experiencing anxiety without feeding the anxiety? Right, um, I think that um, that speaks to what I touched on earlier where we, we want to acknowledge and validate that the feeling is valid for this child. So for us, it looks over the top. It looks like it doesn't make sense. They're having this strong reaction to something that's non-threatening, right? It's just an everyday experience, like going to school. But to the child, it's like they're being they're under attack. So for them, the the, the feeling of danger and fear is very real. So the more that we can we can wrap our head around that, that for our child, this is a real sensation and experience, 
we start there. We acknowledge and validate and, and, and let them know we see them and we hear them. This is that attunement that we want to offer that, that um, I see you, I understand, I, 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 I don't get it, but I get that for you, this is real. So that's a very important distinction. So I might not be able to relate, but I see that this is very distressing and you're not making this up. This feels really scary and hard. And then the things that with the three R's. So then, and I know I, I, I'm looking at some of the questions and these are common questions that um, parents will ask. Um, my child is so aggressive, it's not safe. I can't actually do the regulating with them. So you don't always have to do it with them. And so we want to help them understand that they need to know what they can have in their toolbox. So, so sometimes it's a physical box, you know, of, of fidgets or of things, sensory things like blowing up a, a, a balloon, a punching paper, you know, maybe you have a stack of flyers, maybe you have a pillow, maybe you have some of those pop it, you know, the sensory toys that are available more widely. Um, so based on who your child is, maybe you have a mattress against the wall in the basement and they can run back and forth and they just run into it and get that physical energy so they don't have to flail and because they're 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 so they might be in fight flight they might be in fight or flight, right? We don't know. Likely it's one of those if they're having a very physical reaction like that. If they're freezing, they're probably just panicked and paralyzed. So they're not harming anyone. And so it really is about finding what works for your child, but having a range. So not sticking to just one thing and say, oh, it didn't work. Have a few things, just like all of us, not every day is different. Every moment is different. And so you re regulate first. And when you see the nervous system is not in that state of danger and threat anymore, then you can start to get a little closer. And that's the relate part, right? We go in too soon. It's like going to a, a again, a reptile or an animal that's threatening our, us, we wouldn't do that. We would stay away until we saw some signs that it was safe to approach. Same yes. with our children. They're not meaning to hurt us. They are just like a, an animal in the wild that's being cornered. They will attack if they feel they're under threat and they truly believe they're under threat. Their nervous system is really old. Our nervous systems are super old. We don't, are not up to date with technology and you know to say, did you know that, you know, we're living in 2022, that's not a real threat anymore, you know? So, so we're operating on a very old system. And so we have to respect that. And so we have to also understand that um, keeping them safe, if you have to separate, that is okay. Because you're, you're, you're telling them, I, I understand this is a very real experience for you, but we all have to be safe. And that keeps you safe so that you can't hurt us or yourself. And so we, we want to, again, recognize this. Once they're calm enough, then we go to the reasoning part. We reflect with them. That was really hard. And you were, your feelings were so big, you actually started kicking and hitting me and your sister. And I know you didn't mean to do that. I know you were just, your body, your, your feelings were so big. You got so overwhelmed. You know, I wonder what it, is, what it was about that that made it so hard. And that's when you can start to talk to the upstairs brain. Once you see your child is calm enough. So this is where the parent coaching and parent gaining skills through coaching for confidence, through the kinds of programs that are available in community, I think can help families really wrap their head around this. What does that look like in practical terms? What do you mean when you say do this? What do you mean don't offer reassurance? You know, what do you, you know, so, so, so it can look like many things depending on each family and situation and child. And you can have different children in the same family who have different ways that they cope. So not what, what works with one won't work with the other. And so it's so tailored and nuanced to each child. Yeah, did, I I answer, did I answer that question? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I like how you touched on um, allowing your child to have those big feelings um, and rather than trying to avoid them, giving them the space to like run into a mattress or blow up a balloon or um, need to color to calm down. And I think having those spaces, even within your home, um, can be helpful for children to know, okay, when I'm feeling these big feelings, I have a space where I can go um, and yes. let go and let it out um, rather than just, you know, not letting them feel those feelings at all. 
Right. And some families that I that I've had the privilege of working with have developed sort of like some schools have the calming corner. And so families are taking that on and had like a calming cave. Yeah. And they'll really create a really cozy area for, of a room. And they'll say, this is your safe space. If you need to, and you're having big feelings, you can go in there and we have all your favorite, you know, whatever, fill in the blank, you know, all your things in there and you can choose. And so taking, taking a note from other people's successes, that can be helpful. You know, we think of man cave, you know, you have a place where a dedicated space, it's kind of a branch off of that, right? You have this, this area that's dedicated to your child. So they know that they have the opportunity and they can take action and they can be in charge of that decision rather than being told to go on a timeout. Mm -hmm. So that feels punitive. So if they make the choice to go find a strategy and figure out what actually helps them, then they have some mastery and they say, you, and you acknowledge, wow, you look, you, I can see your body looks calmer now and you're not so, so, so your feelings are not so big. It looks like you're almost ready to talk about things. And so you're planting seeds and you're, again, it's that validation. You're letting them know, I see you and I get you. That's attunement. Mm -hmm. So we all want that as humans. When someone just gets it and they, you look like you're having a hard day, is everything okay? You think, how did they know? Because they are tuned. They're just paying attention. You didn't say, I'm having a really hard day. <laughs> they just know you so well and they are willing to say it and share that because it's connection and it's relating. And we all feel good and feel so seen and understood when this happens. And so our kids are not different. Okay, we have a couple more questions that I'm gonna speed through just mm -hmm. because of the time. Um, I feel like I didn't provide a secure attachment when my child was young due to mental illness and the significant challenges parenting small children. What is your best advice for moving forward from this? How to help repair this? I'm worried I've damaged my child and they will be just like me. Oh, that's a, that's, that's a common question um, that uh, comes up. And so the first, the bottom line is it's never too late. I don't want any parent to leave this talk thinking they damage their children irreparably after hearing about, especially about early years and thinking, well, my child's 13, now what? So I work with older kids too. I don't just work with young children. I want to point that out. I work with teens. I work with school age kids. I work with adults as well. And so my, the, my motto is still the same. It's never too late. We can heal ourselves. We can, you know, we can heal ourselves as parents. We can heal, we can heal our relationships with our children. Even if we weren't the best version of ourselves when they were younger, we can, we can recognize that and we can address that. We can do what we can to improve ourselves and our understanding of what our child needs from us at this stage in development. And we can't go back in time. So there's no point beating yourself up over it, which is where the self-compassion comes in. Forgive yourself for the mistakes you've made. We can't undo it and we can't, we can't rewrite history. So the only thing we can do is learn from it and move forward and say, now that I know that I want to do better. And so how do I do that? So that's one of the questions. How can we repair this? Well, there are ways. So I think the some of the agencies I listed, New Directions is the one that stands out for me, is they have a lot of parenting resources. Circle Security is one of them. They have a connect program that's actually geared towards attachment relationships between parents and ch older children. So it's developed by a Canadian psychologist, I think out of BC, because of the need to look at what does attachment look like as kids get older and they're not so close to parents and now they're in their peer groups and they're relating more to other people. So it's about still establishing that safety and trust and security in the parent-child relationship as their child matures. So New Directions is a really good resource, in my opinion. Um, there are, um, of course, people privately or just individuals that, could, that are more specialized in this kind of work. And so it's never too late. And if you have that perspective, I think that there's a lot you can take away from, let's say, a circle security parenting program, uh, because it touches on the, those topics more extensively. And then, of course, finding someone who can do individual work to extend it beyond, let's say, a parent group would be perhaps a good option if it's not enough, because that could be a very reasonable way to, to receive that kind of support. Okay. Um... We have two more questions. Okay. My seven-year-old will escalate to stuck 
then physical. We have to hold her so everyone is safe. When she has finally calmed down, she feels like she can't move, get up, and also talks like a baby toddler. What do we do with this? Like she'll only use a few words, whisper, point. Okay, so those are all the those are all the same same yeah. person. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so what this sounds like, it sounds like these are descriptions of the flight, fight, freeze reactions in probably different stages. You know, first it might be fight because you know that in that moment it's that's the reaction that seems to be fitting the moment. And then the freeze, you know, just not moving, can't get up, you know, maybe she's flopping and she's too big to be picked up. So now you've got this very heavy child who's not small. You're not a baby or a toddler, but then now it's behaving like a much younger child. So that's very common. Why do we do this? Well, this is very, um, I think it's very basic. We know that when we're little, we people come to us and, and take care of us. So we're relational social beings. So if what I'm doing is not working, I'm not getting my needs met. So I'm going to keep going until I get my needs met, right? So if, if getting angry or showing you like this doesn't work or freezing doesn't work, then I'm going to do whatever's left, right? And so the my takeaway points are still the same, which is we start with first understanding for your child this is a very real experience and it's valid for them. So if we can stay with that first, you know, it, it can take some mental work on the part of the parent to say, okay, it seems ridiculous to me, but for my child, it's real. So that the self-talk could be there for the parent to say, I have to, I need to be genuine when I approach my child. And, and, and I think before that, right, you're not talking to them if they're in that state, you're, you're, you're talking to them in advance and saying, when your feelings are really big and you start hitting, we're going to move you into your calming space and over in your calming space, you're going to have a bin and you can choose. Do you want to color? Do you want to blow a balloon? Do you want to, you know, based on who your child is. So of course, um, we're not talking directly, but those are the kind of questions I would ask you if we were if we were meeting. I would ask you, what are the things that are calming for your child? And then I would have a few options available. So you're not trying to find it in this moment of distress. You have it already identified. You've already you have it in a in an identified area. You've had a conversation at some point with your child to let them know this is the new plan. When you start to have really big feelings, we're going to ask you. We're going to support you in helping you. So we're going to give you some choices about how you can calm your body down because your brain is telling you there's something to be worried about, but there's nothing here, but you, you don't believe us yet. So we need to help your body believe us. So for, to do that, you need this, right? It might be the mattress. It might be jump rope in the basement. It might be, it's cold today, but you know, the snow's not here yet. Get outside, jump up and down, run around. If you have a play structure, if you have a swing, swing. If you have some kind of physical monkey bars, that can be very calming. Give them some work, make them sweep, make them carry in the groceries. Heavy work can be very calming. Put a weighted, weighted vest or heavy backpack. There's lots of different things that can work, but it depends on your child. So then that's that first thing. So it's like recognize that. So it's going back to the same, top, same themes we've already addressed. It's valid for your child. Find the things that regulate, then relate. Right. Once they start to look calmer, you were really, really upset earlier. We we're trying to help you to not feel so upset and to calm your body down. And and now you're not this this angry tiger, you know, lion that's going to attack. Right. So your child doesn't perceive you that way. They are not, you know, reacting that way. So you're starting to relate. And then you're then once they are showing more signs of calm and regulation, then you have that conversation. You know, that was really hard. What was going on? What do you think was going on there? This is building capacity for self-reflection, self-awareness and insight so that the next time they can go, oh, I recognize this feeling. I'm going to go to my, my calming corner. I'm going to go to my bin of, of, of toys that I can work on, right? And so we want to build up that capacity and that sometimes they might say, I know my daughter's done this. Paper, you know, so she likes to punch flyers. So that's one of the things that works for her. And I forget it. And I try to save the flyers that come, you know, weekly so that I have them ready. And so sometimes she reminds me, says, mommy, paper. So I hold it up, she punches, and it instantly, for her, it works. It instantly moves her out of that funky mood to laughing and playfulness. And so we, that period is like this tiny because we get in there, we get out. And so the more you can get in, get out, the, the more success you have with this, the more you can identify that, 
Yeah, and so the baby talk will continue until again. So then that's the little signs that she's not ready, you know, that that your child is not ready yet. And it could be still like, okay, let's go back to your bin. Let's go back to your corner. Let's go find something else. Right. So and you're not you're not necessarily going to get to a place where there's no baby talk. You might just say, oh, I, I hear a baby here. Tells me that your your body, you're still having some big feelings and you want to show me by telling me you're a baby. I see. Right. It's that validation. Babies get our attention. They cry. They crawl. They can't say complex things. So we do come to them. So it makes sense that they regress to baby talk, to crawling, right? She flops to the floor. She wants to be picked up like a baby because babies can't walk. They, you must go to them, right? So from that perspective, it makes sense. Now, it doesn't, make, it doesn't help when you're in the moment and you're really stressed as a parent. I know this can sound like crazy talk. And so... Again, it's it's one of these things, it's a practice. The more folks practice this, the more it becomes natural. It becomes natural for your child, for you as an adult, as the parent supporting your child. And I do hope that those who hung out here today, and, and I do appreciate everyone, whoever did stick around, hanging out for the extended time um, to get into some of these questions, because these are the common struggles that families have. And I know there's so much more we can say about this, but I do hope that I've addressed them well enough to take something away here today. Okay, I am gonna ask one last question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Okay. Uh, Cause Dana asked this a while ago. How do I assist my daughter when her friends important fr relationships are in different classes? She's very upset every week, crying, shaking, wants to leave school, um, having no friends in her actual grade 10 classes. It's hard when she's not sleeping and up late worrying about school crying for school yeah I know I mean I think that we could go scenario by scenario and all the different for these different families and and I think the underlying message is is very similar right because they're all going to be a little different depending on this age and situ situation that your child is facing but the underlying concern is the same they feel out of sorts they don't feel comfortable it's just so distressing that they're not with their group people they feel they really belong with and belong to and they have a sense of belonging and that's so important and I think validating that of course you don't feel like you don't feel like you have your friends I'm so sorry are there ways that you can see each other or connect because you're not in the same classes are there you know can you make a plan to have lunch together before, and not leave it to chance because I know sometimes that happens and they don't get to sit together because so and so and sat next to them so I have helped teens think about can they text them and say, oh, can we meet for lunch? So they make a plan. So they already know and they can anticipate that they have that special connection time. And that can get them through that next part of their day. And that can give them something to look forward to. They might even text them the night before and say, hey, do you want to have, do you want to meet for lunch tomorrow? Or do you want to meet at whatever, if there's a five minute break between class by our locker, you know, and just gossip or chat or whatever, something like that, just that brief connection something to hold on to make a plan again but that's in that re um, reflection part that's that after you they she's regulated you have related now you're going to reason right so your child has to be calm enough to hear these ideas and problem solve with you because without it you're talking to a, 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 a you know a cornered animal right you're not talking to an evolved human who has the capacity to problem solve and think so does that answer that last question yeah, no, I think I think that's that's a great answer. And I I love how you started it with acknowledge acknowledging the child's feelings and validating them because so often we do it out of with a good heart trying to fix the problem. But sometimes our children and teens just need to hear how you feel is okay. And it's it's normal to feel that way. And um, yeah, I, I really like that you that you brought that up. So that concludes our question period. I want to thank you for being here today, Dr. Malik. That was so very informative and you did a great job of answering all those questions as well. And thank you everyone for your questions. That also concludes our Adam Talks Mental Illness Week. So I just want to thank everyone for being here and yeah, thank you so much again. Thank you for having me. Of course, take care. Take care, bye-bye.